Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis on this Sunday, March 31st, 2024. Five Sundays in March, and look at you. You're here. So glad to see you. First Unitarian Society is a member congregation of the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations. Our programming is on-site live. Are we online live today? Yes! Hello, online. Online live and on demand, 24-7. My name is Reverend Kelly Clement, and I am joined today by our senior minister, the Reverend Dr. David Breeden, by our accompanist, Amos Lucidi, and by our very own composer and tenor, Paul Redessel. Wherever you are, if you will turn to your right or your left and say, I'm so happy you're here today. <laughs> Welcome everyone to this place of love and justice where we attempt to live up to humanity's highest ideals and highest hopes. Do we fail? Often. Do we try again? Always. That's the work of the humanist spirit. Thank you so much for being with us today. Good morning. I'm very happy to be here sharing my songs with you today. The first one, a text by Reverend David, is called For Change. And I wrote it before we knew that both he and Rev. Kelly were going to be leaving us. Uh, and before I knew the theme this month would be transformation and change. That's serendipity, but somehow it works out. <laughs> service, we begin by lighting our chalice. Will you please join me in these words of the third aspiration of First Unitarian Society? We aspire to pursue wisdom through reason, science, art, and the stories of civilizations. 
And now we get to sing. Number 301 in the Gray Songbook for the, for the Touch the Earth, Reach the Sky. And uh, please rise as you're willing and able, and we'll sing together. for our congregational covenant. Love is the spirit of this place and service its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Thank you. Please be seated. First Unitarian Society is a congregational humanist community. We are here for each other, our neighbors, and for the planet. When we gather on Sundays, we take a few moments to reflect on the human experience, the sorrows, the joys, the milestones. We do this so that we stay in touch with our own humanity and to remind ourselves of the value of a moment of stillness. Downstairs, we Hope that you'll stop by a card basket and send a note to folks who are unable to attend assembly today or people that we mention in Joys and Sorrows. We want to uh, give our warm thoughts to Larry and Pat Gotchhock. This week, Larry will have a long-awaited heart procedure, a heart surgery, and uh, we know that you are very glad that the, you're getting on with it. You've been waiting for a while. We hold you close as you navigate these tender days. And I want to say a word on this trans day of visibility about how blessed we are, yes, blessed, in this congregation to have trans members and friends among us. Our lives are enriched by their presence. They are we. And we lift them up as a blessing to us for all our trans non-binary, gender non-conforming folks who call First Unitarian Society home. We are so glad that you are a part of this community. Let's take a few moments of, of silence to reflect on those in our world who work for comfort, to comfort the suffering, and who work for justice. When I breathe in, 
important German poets of the early 20th century. And there are a couple of themes or forces that appear very often in his poetry. One is uh, the idea of die Dinge, more or less material things, material world, about which he was rather ambivalent and still trying to figure out. Second was a rather unorthodox, um, mystic idea of Gott, God, obviously. And in this poem, he is still trying to figure out, I think, both of them where he fits in. More later from, from David. <laughs> uh, but first, the translation. <laughs> okay? Okay. I live my life in ever widening circles that stretch themselves out over all the things. I won't perhaps complete the last one, but I intend to try. I circle around God, around the ancient tower, as I have circled for thousands of years. And I don't know yet. Am I a falcon, a storm, or a mighty song? Thanks so much, Paul, and thanks for giving me the idea. I wanted to talk about change and transformation, and this is a perfect poem to discuss that sort of thing, so thank you. I uh, had a, a back jaw tooth pulled this week, so if I'm a little confused, I'm still on very uh, heavy uh, pain medication, but you know, hey, you know, I never had my, uh, my wisdom teeth taken out because the old farmer's tale is that your Life is half over when you have your wisdom uh, tooth taken out. So I'm going to do it in about a decade uh, from, from now. That's my plan. Rainer Maria Rilke died in 1926, early 20th century. Rilke is usually numbered among the greatest of the spiritual poets up there with Rumi and Hafiz and William Blake. Part of the power of Rilke is his use of symbols often in stark, bold contrasts, as in the poem we just heard. Let me reread it just a moment for you. I live my life in ever-widening circles that stretch themselves out over all the things. I won't perhaps complete the last one, but intend to try. I circle around God, around the ancient tower, as I have circled for thousands of years, and I don't know yet, am I a falcon, a storm, or a mighty song? Now, just notice how he lays these things out. 
ever widening circles, further and further out, okay? They stretch themselves over all the things. Things, uh, you probably know some Chinese philosophy, all the things, the 10,000 things, are, are the material existence that we experience through our perceptions. So I circle around God, around the, the ancient tower, am I a falcon, a storm, or a mighty song? Now this is classic Rilke. The ever-widening circles are about life's journey, aren't they? That's fairly clear, I think. And that odd line is classic Rilke. I circle around God, around the ancient tower. Now, is God the ancient tower? Is part of the question. I don't know the answer, but I'm going to bet on one today. <laughs> is the tower about strength, in which case God makes sense, in this context, or is the tower about human artifacts, human ego, human beings building stuff out of the 10,000 things, the material? Or is it a both? Which, of course, often in Rilke, you can read it two or three ways. And I will come back to that, but I want to start in a different direction and then come back to it. Last Sunday, I discussed how a non-authoritarian way of being and acting leads each of us toward an open questioning of reality itself, that which we perceive with our senses, reality. Now, one of the things I mentioned last week, a side effect of that process is to decrease the power of that harsh inner voice, the voice of the dictator within, that voice that insistently tells you, should, 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 must, 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 obey my authority. As I said last week, the dictator always answers why questions with, because I told you so, because I said so. However, the art and creativity of life lies in answering why with, I wonder, huh, interesting, that sort of thing. And that's what we try to do here. As I said last week, that's exactly what our Ethical Explorers program for younger people is, and it's a model for lifelong learning, which is something we here at FUS very much believe in. We're not about data dump, we are about experience. That's the way we focus. A place where we take that why question seriously, and then we look at it from various perspectives, philosophically, theologically, psychologically, sociologically, and on, but mostly about art, the way of producing art as experience in our world. Because, as I said last week, each of us is the artist of our lives. You got no choice about that. The question is whether we accept it or not. And I say the wisdom says, yes, do. The question is whether to accept or duck responsibility for your own human agency, what you do in the world. That decision, the decision to take responsibility for your own life is the deepest form of transformation because you're playing without a net. This week, I want to think about the possibility of taking the inevitability of change by the throat, if you will, or at least in stride, and we can say to that Cartman within, I'm watching you. I'm going to take my opportunities to grow. And here's a question that's a little more open-ended. Is G-O-D, God, got, a proper noun or just a noun? Or do those letters function as more than one thing? I think they do. Maybe it's both a word and a symbol at the same time, which gets complicated, doesn't it? Maybe it's also a concept. Concept, symbol, word. In which case, God, what Rilke is saying is that God, like a tower, is a human invention which I think is what he's saying. Because the only way to get to this place of the mighty song is to dismiss social constructions, I think. Now, consider this for example. 
The philosopher Timothy Morton, I've mentioned him before, by the way, he's non-binary they, in their book, Hyper Objects, opines that we human beings are considerably more comfortable talking about infinity than large quantifiable numbers. Now let that sink in a minute. We're more comfortable thinking about infinity, forever, that sort of thing, than we are thinking about a number like 3,212,000. What is it about our brains that does that? But realizing it is, I think, important. We can easily imagine the end of the world, but we can't imagine the end of COVID. They're just different in our brains. God is an easy concept for whatever reason. I don't know why. Why is the human brain more comfortable with forever, infinity, God, those big things, rather than quantifiable numbers? Timothy Morton writes, there is a real sense in which it is far easier to conceive of forever than a large finitude. Forever makes you feel important. 100,000 years makes you wonder whether you can imagine 100,000 of anything. In quote, you get the point. Now, yes, I am a mathematical myself, as many know around here, but uh, so I don't think about numbers very much at all. But uh, yeah, I do think about, you know, God and reality a lot. And so there you go. It's just easier. Now, let's, let's think this through. What this tells us is that it's easier for the average human being to think about God and eternity than something they can actually do in the world. Isn't that odd? God or the national debt? We would rather think about God. It's, it's just easier, right? A concept is an abstract idea or a mental representation of things, materiality. Right? Meaning actions also and qualities, relationships and those kinds of things. It does not have a physical form and exists only in the mind. Justice is a concept. There is no justice. We just try to get at that, that concept by what we do. That's how our brains work. A symbol, on the other hand, is a physical or tangible representation that stands for or suggests something else. So a heart is love, right? We all know that. A cross is Christianity. Now keep in mind that the largest monotheisms in our world, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all forbid symbolic representation of G-O-D. Graven images, as you know, is one of the top 10 bad things to do. <laughs> Concepts are mental constructs that we use to think about reality, whatever that is, another abstract concept, I guess, while symbols are the, main, are the means through which these concepts are communicated or represented to others. Symbols, then, like, you know, the blindfolded lady with the, with the, the scaly things there, you know, that's justice. What does that have to do with anything about justice? It's an abstract concept for us, and that's, that's what to start thinking about, I think, if we want to really get at what Rilke is saying and maybe what many of us are saying. So if I have this right, each human mind is a concept, has a concept of God, or for atheists, the sort of God that you don't believe in, but you probably chose one not to believe in, right? <laughs> that concept is described in symbols, in the case of English, the letters G-O-D. But then back to Rilke and those lines. Because exactly where here is the why the writing and reading of poetry struck me as interesting decades ago. Exactly what this line does. I circle around God, around the ancient tower. As a poet, playing with those symbols and those concepts and those words has always been very meaningful to me because I've suspected that I can get at some kind of truth with, it, with a little t. This is a very old trope in mystical thought, that circling, circling, and circling the ancient tower. The still point in the turning world, as the mystical poet T.S. Eliot phrased it. That is mysticism, that point that does not turn, right? But is the ancient tower G.O.D. God, 
or is it another sort of symbol? For example, many European poets in the early 20th century, when Eliot and Rilke lived and wrote, used symbols that they considered to be archetypes. If you know Jungian psychology, you know about archetypes. Now, very basic symbols are archetypes then, buried deep in the human psyche, according to these poets and, and psychologists anyway, deep in the human psyche somewhere, and then poets will pull it out and share it. In this case, one of the big things, and Rilke was interested in the tarot, so I think this probably is referring with the tower to the tarot deck. In the case of tarot, the symbolism is initially frightening. Oh my God, I'm going to be leap leaping out of a burning tower. Is that what my future is? The lightning bolt represents a sudden insight that leads to a major shift in understanding or perspective. Lightning hits, catches on fire, these people jump out. It's a transformation. The writer deck is the one on the right, more contemporary one is the one on the left. You begin to see why Rilke is a spiritual genius when you reflect on this. The tower is almost certainly a symbol for things human built. A tower is created by human beings. It's built out of social norms. It's the concretization of social needs and wishes, right? But is the tower always going to say, because I say so? Is it always going to be a human formation? And you'll notice on this, I put this in the deck there just because it's, uh, I think it's a little more abstract than this, but your handy dandy beginner's guide to tarot says your thoughts and beliefs are keeping you from realizing the hard reality of the world. Just stop being too defensive. That's a very simple way to think about this, I think, but, but it works anyway. And yeah, you're going to lose your romance because most people use tarot for romantic relationship predictions, actually, right? All right, so that's why Rilke is good at what he does. He sets up these assumptions. Now, look at this one, and what you will see on the left there is that the tower is made very much, illustrated very much like the Tower of Babel, which God didn't like, by the way, if you didn't read your Bible recently. Uh, God didn't like human beings being so egotistical that they built a tower, and so... God made everybody speak a different language so we couldn't cooperate as human beings anymore, right? So the Tower of Babel often comes in. Also, more contemporary illustrations often show something like the Twin Towers or some kind of a big skyscraper building that, that is burning, right? So these are the ways that we tear down the assumptions, if that makes sense. In some tarot decks, the tower is explicitly the Tower of Babel, and God doesn't like it. Is Rilke saying that the G.O.D. symbol and the tower symbols are both in reality only human constructs, only human concepts that should perhaps be reimagined? Can we think about human assumptions and God differently is the question. Now, this ambiguity reveals Rilke's poetic genius, and I think a spiritual genius as well. And that, for, for brilliant poets, those two things often go together. Yes, the tarot card s signifies the breakdown of existing structures. It, it is change, right? And it serves as a symbol of the destruction of the ego, the self, the human assumptions, the I, 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 the almighty white patriarchal I, ego, right, that Freud talks about, which is just another word for I anyway, right? We, we make this assumptions coming out of the ways that we have been alive in the world. But how do we reach transformation? How do we get to art? Which is what Rilke thinks of as the way we can really change our minds, and I agree with them. Sure, transformation can hurt, but ultimately transformation is about liberation, Right? And liberation is possible through the reconsideration of the symbol systems that we live with. I think this is what Rilke is saying. To check myself on these assumptions, I asked my friendly AI program to rewrite the Rilke poem. 
in the spirit of Flat and Scruggs, which is music I understand, right? And so AI cooperated and wrote the Rilke Cannonball. Now, I only changed this a little bit, by the way. In circles ever broadening, uh, it, it, uh, the AI can't do dialect. This really makes me irritated, but it can't do. <laughs> In circles ever broadening across the land, they gently sprawl, stretching wide o'er hills and valleys, over every mountain tall, round the almighty I wander. Oh, that's why I wanted to do this, around the mighty I wander, round the old, tower old and grand. So AI thinks these two symbols go together as well. And I think I agree. Am I a hawk, a soarin', or a storm upon this land? Or perhaps a song that's mighty, born from deep within the heart, echoes through these endless circles where Indians just to start, where Indians just to start. So that's Flatten Scruggs writing Rilke. So it puts these two ideas together, and I, and I do think that they do. Although AI rushes past the point in order to get to the final question of the poem, the, the AI thinks the last question is the important one. Am I a falcon, a storm, or a mighty song? Now think about those symbols for a moment. A falcon silently circles a tower, doesn't it? Yeah. A storm crashes in violently, and then it's gone. It's another way to be, according to Rilke. Clearly, a mighty song is what the poet is aiming at. It's what Rilke wants to do with his life. And I add that Rilke has managed to do that, given the evidence of the poem's staying power in the artistic world. This sucker's uh, 100 years old and more. The point of our existence, according to Rilke, is to create that work of art that is our lives. We are the artists of our lives. And the way to that transcendent art is breaking through social constructions in order to see clearly as a self. Now, this is me about 30 years ago or so. Artists have always known that we can in some way deal with the language of the holy or the sacred. 30 some odd years ago, this is obviously Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco, where else, right? Getting a poetry blessing before the ashes of two San Francisco street poets, Bob Kaufman and Jack Micheline. So I'm officially in the street poet, uh, well, it wouldn't be Hall of Fame, would it? They died in the street. Uh, but, uh, you know, if I ever run out of other things to do in my retirement, I can go to San Francisco and die in the street. It's an option, right? <laughs> and maybe I'll get my ashes in there. Now, let's look just a moment at these guys. Bob Kaufman um, is on the left. Yeah, flip on through uh, there. We don't want to see. There, there. Bob Kaufman is on the left. He's known in France as the American Rimbaud. We don't know much about him here in the US. He just kind of was there, one of the street poets in the beatnik era. But the American Rimbaud. Um, sometimes, especially in France, for some reason, poets get translated better than they are in English. And that's, that's the case with Edgar Allan Poe as well, as you may, as you may know. So Bob Coffin is the American Rimbaud. And the, and the guy on, the, on your right there is Jack Michelin. Uh, one of the finest uh, uh, performance poets ever, as far as I can, uh, I'm concerned. He literally died sort of on the street in a BART a train going through San Francisco, Bay Area rapid transit. Uh, so I think, and I think he would be pleased to die on, on uh, BART. But, so there you go. Now, I go back to these guys and I talk about this to leave you with this. Many of you know the work of Alan Lightman. He's a favorite of, uh, among our folks because he has two assignments at MIT as a professor. Right? He is a theoretical physicist and he's also in the humanities department because he writes poetry. Right? So I wanted, I've been reading one of his books recently. The reason a lot of free thinkers follow Lightman's work is that he puts scientific materialism together with 
a kind of mysticism that I'm going to share with you in just a moment. In his newer book, The Transcendent Brain, Spirituality in the Age of Science, Lightman writes this, most transcendent experiences are completely ego-free. Now, that's exactly what we were talking about breaking down the tower, right? Are completely ego-free. In the moment, we lose track of time and space. We lose track of our bodies. We lose track of ourselves. We dissolve. And yet, spirituality emerges from consciousness and the material brain. And the paramount signature of consciousness is a sense of self, an I-ness distinct from the rest of the cosmos. Thus, curiously, a thing centered on self creates a thing absent of self. That's the key to mysticism, and it's the key to the Rilke poem. Uh, I think that's exactly what Rilke is talking about. Change is inevitable. We know that. Transformation is not inevitable. How do we turn the inevitable change into the good transformation? Now, there is this thing called religious creativity. We don't talk about it a lot around here, but it's how people use the material that we pick up through life about spirituality, about world religions, and all those things, and we put them together, and then we are religiously creative. That's why I write poetry in this way. So let's stop thinking of the human religious impulse as hidebound and dusty. Religious creativity is as new as the next time you think about this. All right, that's how it works. Rilke wasn't anybody special either, until he's, he began to chip away at the ego. Uh, not, many of you know one of, another of his poems that ends, you must change your life. And his idea is that with art, you're always going to be hit with it and say, damn, I gotta change my life. I have to do something outside of the common spiritual answers to life. I have to rethink God and the tower. So, so religious creativity, the religious impulse is with us all the time. I don't know if it's a religious impulse or not. That, you know, that's what it's been called. But is it religious impulse? I don't know. Spiritual impulse? Spiritual but not religious? I don't know. But we all seem to have it. And as I mentioned earlier, we also have this ease with saying God and thinking about in, you know, eternity and that kind of thing. Something about our brains. Last Sunday, I made a claim asking what are we here for if not to listen to the universe as closely as we can, to conform to the universe as closely as we can, and to live our stories as honestly as we can. Only you are the artist of your life if you take responsibility. Alan Lightman also writes this in the book. Most transcendent experiences, those true religious, mystical experiences, most transcendent experiences are completely ego-free in the moment. We lose track of time, right? We lose all, all of that. And yet, if you tag each of the atoms in your body, he says, this is a scientist, and follow them backward in time, through the air that you breathed during your life, through the food that you ate, back through the geological history of the earth, through the ancient seas and soil, back to the formation of the earth out of the solar nebular cloud, and then out into the interstellar space, you could trace each of your atoms, those exact atoms, to particular massive stars in the past of our galaxy. At the end of our lifetimes, those stars exploded, at the end of their lifetime, those stars exploded and spewed out their newly forged atoms into space, later to condense into uh, planets and oceans and plants and your body at this moment. I think that's a heck of a lot better than any religious story I know of about that, right? And I think that is what the poets are calling us to do. That's why I write poetry anyway. It's, it's why people read poetry. It's why we 
keep circling around that ancient tower, thinking about it, considering it, breaking down our conglomerated selves into a new being that is the artist. And we will continue looking for ways to break down assumptions and egotism that keeps us from realizing our true selves. Thank you. It must have been some good drugs last week, David. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Let's sing together, I Know I Can Go On, is number 1015 in the Teal Songbook. The lyrics will come up here, and the, the notes may be helpful to those of you who read music. So let's, let's give it a go. Julie Stewart and I serve on your board of trustees. Today's talk has been about change and change is certainly in the air here. When I joined the board of trustees about a year ago, I found out at my very first meeting in May of 2023 that our senior minister was going to be retiring within a year. Gulp. <laughs> I, I hadn't exactly been prepared for that. Those whom I serve with on the board have come to know that for better or for worse, I always want to be prepared. <laughs> so throughout the past year, I've been peppering board members, primarily George, our chair with questions. What do we do first? What do we do next? What about this contingency? What about that contingency? What struck me about our board was that everybody seemed pretty laid back about the whole thing. I didn't know what to make of that. 
my anxiety came to a head when the board had to go before all of you on the Sunday of David's announcement. My experience in business and PR gave me visions of difficult, even hostile questions. A firing squad, if you will. <laughs> the kind I'd faced before in press conferences. Not sure what was coming, I mainly observed that meeting. And what I found was that despite having a full room and lots of thoughtful, perceptive questions, we weren't facing a firing squad. Board members were relaxed and weren't afraid to say, I don't know, if in fact they didn't know the answer. This impressed me. In fact, what I felt most fully coming from that room full of people, coming from you, was goodwill, confidence, and trust. Confidence in who we are as a congregation, confidence that we'd get through this period of change successfully, as we have before, and trust in each other. Trust is a powerful and precious quality that binds together successful communities, and I felt it in spades that day. I came away feeling so lucky to be part of FUS. So if, like me, you feel lucky to be here, please consider making a financial contribution. <laughs> the easiest way to give is to scan this QR code, which maybe will show up. There it is. <laughs> which will take you to our giving page. There you will find several easy ways to contribute to the mission of First Unitarian Society. And of course, those of you in the building who wish to give cash or checks may stop by our office. Thank you for making the work of First Unitarian Society possible. Thank you, Julie. I'm Alan Callender. I'm one of the members of the auction team. And this is an update on the auction. Uh, as of today, we've already sold more than 20, raised more than $22,000. But we're not done. In case you haven't heard the word, we are continuing to sell seats to some of the most amazing activities, uh, parties, cocktail parties, tequila parties, Super Bowl parties. Uh, we have family activities that are still available, um, tours, uh, laughter yoga, coaching. And then we've got the most amazing Week in Paradise donation from the Borden Stein family. And that's still being uh, hotly uh, bid on. The bidding is available until tonight. And so if you haven't had a chance yet, you can still go to the FUS website and click on the auction link and you can uh, uh, get your bid in for those. Um, we have, uh, we're going to have uh, some, uh, uh, Barb's going to be in the office, I believe, uh, later on here. And if, uh, by the way, there's still, uh, we haven't collected all of the funds yet. Uh, we're not worried because we know where everybody lives. <laughs> and, uh, but we uh, will be finishing this up and hopefully have a complete report uh, by next week. And we can't, can't uh, encourage it enough to still continue looking for these opportunities to be part of our community. And one last shout out in case, uh, just because it just has to be done. The most amazing job by Barb Lutz yeah. as chair of this team. So, thank you. Thank you, Alan and Julie. A few announcements. After assembly today, we hope those of you online will have something tasty to eat. For those of us here in the building, please join us downstairs for our mini meal. Uh, we'll have not your father's nachos which is a casserole, but I don't know why it's not listed as a hot dish. Whatever. <laughs> um, layers of chips, cheese, tomatoes, and spicy mock duck, or ballpark scramble, roast potatoes, sausage, onion, and sauerkraut, and perfect pear crisp. Yeah. Uh, a couple of notes to say. While you are downstairs, please be sure and stop by the Active Voices table to sign postcards today for returning white earth land, supporting a couple of bills to justly return um, over 100,000 acres of the white earth state forest land back to the white earth band of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe 
and also to improve e-waste recycling. Uh, both important uh, bills that our Active Voices team will have at their table. I also want to note that uh, you still have time to register for the upcoming teen suicide prevention training on Saturday, April 13th. We're saying spend a Saturday to save a life. We're gonna learn QPR training, which stands for Question, Persuade, Refer. And it's been said to me that it's like CPR for your brain. So there should be some flyers on the welcome table. We're, I hope we've got some posters on the uh, bulletin boards uh, that have a QR code on them where you can register. It's free event, but registration is required. And of course that information came out in the Friday email. Yes, thank you, thank you. Okay, I think we'll extinguish our chalice. Please join me in these words. We extinguish this flame, but not but of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. All these we carry in our hearts and in our minds until we are together again. One last song with words by Reverend David uh, called What We Find Here. Uh, and it's a very truthful telling of what happens in communities and congregations. It's not all sweetness and light and we hearts beating together, but uh, there are things like Julie spoke about this morning that keep us here. It's very important. Almost. into the world. Be fearless. Ask questions. Hold on to what is good. Strengthen the weak. Comfort the fearful. Serve the suffering. Do what makes you come alive because, as the great Howard Thurman says, what this world needs is more people who have come alive. Rejoice in the power of the human spirit. So may it be.